All right, so this is another week of Black Diplomats, and I am here with the hip hop president. And so um, we're going to talk about um, foreign policy and HBCU campuses. And for everybody who don't know, this is uh, Dr. Walter Kimbrough, president of my alma mater, Philando Smith College, as well as Dillard University in Louisiana. And so the hip hop press, um, welcome to the show, man. How, how you doing? Appreciate it. I'm doing good today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I usually ask my guests anytime they come on the show, you know, like, how you doing before we get into all this heavy talk about politics and whatever, man. Just just how you doing being a black man in America? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. No, it's it's been good. Uh, my oldest child just graduated from high school, so we did that um, a couple of days ago. So that was really good, and she's about to go to college at Fordham in New York. So we're about to have the big change where you got one going to school and then the, the youngest – will start 10th grade next year. So, you know, down to one in the house and he's just got three years left. So, you know, just watching things, you know, it's work with your family, how things change. So we're going through that now. So it's good. It's good. I feel like when I saw your family, you were at Philander and I was I actually just left Peace Corps. And I took a job as a college admissions uh, counselor. And I remember your kids and they were small. They did Yes, because this is 2005. And so now they're going to, one of them is going to Fordham. That's in Queens. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That's yeah. that's uh, that's just life just rolls by you, man. Yeah, wow. it does. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of folks, particularly from Philander, who will just say, man, I remember when they were babies because Lydia was born in 2006. So, you know, people just like shock. And I was like, yeah, all of y'all are getting old because <laughs> they're just sort of shocked. Like, I remember when she was born. It's like, yeah, and y'all are now, you got your own families and all kind of things. So, yeah, man. You know, I, I, I remember that transition year I was taking, um, I took at Philander essentially because I had just finished Peace Corps. I was in the country of Georgia and mm-hmm. I didn't want to jump into a graduate program. Right. And so, you know, that job at Philander, I was familiar with the place, graduated from and knew the people. And so that's where I met you. Yeah. You know, you know, when you were the president there and I, you know, when I was there, I never thought that I would be where I am right now. Like, you know, just just think about that scene It's 2005. And then now this is 2024. Right. And so I'm in Ukraine and I'm, of course, I'm an independent journalist and I cover the war. And so I am writing about and, and doing video stories about the worst moments in people's lives, you know, and I am going to be taking some hostile training, um, hostile environment training next week is three days. And so they're simulating a war environment <laughs> like for journalists. So they simulate you being in a trench. And so I'm doing all of that training before I go out with uh, some soldiers to the east where they're fighting Russians right now because a lot of people, when they see photos of me, they say, wow, man, you cave, it looks like it could be a city in the United States, which it could be. But people don't realize that this is a huge country. It's one of the largest countries in Europe. And so you can literally be in the center of, of, of Ukraine with the exception of the Russians, Russians lobbing missiles at you and the outages. It looks normal, but then you drive about eight to 10 hours, it's Russians there. So that's the dichotomy and dynamic that I'm in. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, this week I want, I'm really, I thought that you would be the real, the best person to talk to about these student protests that are taking place across campuses in the United States. And it's all dealing with Gaza and specifically the White House's response to it. And, you know, if you read a bunch of articles going on about HBCUs, they, they say that some HBCUs are part of the conversation, but not to the same degree as a Columbia or a Berkeley or something like that. Now, here's the thing. Um, you have some HBCUs like Xavier in Louisiana that rescinded U.S. U.N. Ambassador um, Linda Thomas Greenfield's invitation to speak because of her votes via the White House to block a ceasefire resolution. And then Joe Biden spoke at Morehouse and even though the people really didn't protest, they, um, the speakers that went before him during the commencement strongly criticized his policies. And right. as a two-term president, I'm curious, how have you been looking at these HBCU responses, particularly 
to to what's been going on with the war in Gaza compared to the PWIs, the uh, predominantly right. white institutions? Well, so the way I've looked at it is a couple of ways. Most of the campuses where you've had the most vigorous protests are your more privileged campuses. There are places that charge 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year. They have billion dollar endowments. So these are places where you got students who can at the you know, moment's notice go on Amazon, buy a tent, <laughs> camp out and not worry about anything else. It's it's a it's it's a privileged protest that's going on because you don't see the same level of protest at community colleges. Why? Because you have non-traditional students who have families who work jobs. They work two jobs. They don't have time to say, I'm going to put up a tent on campus and protest. They have to deal with life right now. So people don't want to deal with it like that. But when like the places you mentioned, Columbia, Berkeley, Vanderbilt, NYU, I mean, most of the overwhelming majority, even the public institutions, like a Wisconsin or a UNC Chapel Hill. These are the places where you have very few Pell Grant eligible students. These are privileged campuses. And so it is a protest of the privilege in many kind of ways because the average, and when people think of college students, they think, you know, 18, 24 years old, when technically most college students today are older than that. So college students, we have to have, you know, a broader idea of what it means to be a college student. And so many go to community colleges. And like I said, those are folks hustling, trying to, you know, you got to work because inflation is high. They don't have time for this. And so people look, so I look at it like that. I think then for HBCUs, it's magnified because now you're talking about places where you're 60, 70, 80% Pell Grant eligible students. So they definitely don't have, they're trying to figure out, do I have enough money to get through the rest of the semester? And how do I get my down payment for my housing and registration for the fall? And so it's just, it's not that they don't care. I think people are paying attention but it's like, I got to deal with the here and now, right now. And, and that is it, just not impacting me. Even the HBCUs that they covered that are engaged are the more privileged institutions. The Atlanta University Center, fewer Pell Grant eligible students. Howard? Howard. I mean, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same <laughs> thing. They're the places that charge the most money, have the fewest Pell Grant students, and have the largest endowments. So if you look at the HBCUs with the largest endowments, Howard, Spelman, Morehouse, Xavier. I mean, those are the West where the protests are. So I always link it in terms of the economics that are driving who is engaged in this. And it's not necessarily a measure of student interest. It's just like they've got so many other life pressures. They don't have time for it. It doesn't make them bad people, but it's just just like the average American citizen. You don't have people who are just, you know, I work at Popeye's. It's like, man, I'm protest gods and I'm not going to work today. No, I got to go to work because I got to take care of my kids. It's just practical. So, I mean, that's the way that I look at it. It's, you know, a lot, some places have time where they can really lean in. And I've been reading some campuses. People say, we're not going home for the summer and we're going to just stay here and protest. That ain't happening at no HBCU. Everybody got to go work. They got to do something. Even at the privileged places, they got, or they're just like, man, I got this internship. I'm going to do this internship. I, it's, I mean, right. Real, it's just real life. I mean, that's, like I said, they make people bad. And I think people just try to place it as well. HBC students aren't as engaged. It's like, no, it's they got some immediate needs right now. And that's just not impacting their day to day. It is, you know, and I've, I've actually had to think about my own trajectory of being engaged in foreign policy. So when I was at Philander and this is the years 1998 to 2022. And so what was happening then, you know, the, the first uh, the second Iraq war was taking place. Yeah there right and so i don't remember any type of protest whatsoever at philander it wasn't like we didn't care right that was the whole thing like we were definitely talking about it but as far as somebody organizing it wasn't and just as you were saying about the priorities because H philander you you were the president of philander yeah. that's a commuter school yeah right and so and high, people, and 70 plus percent pale 75 percent pale eligible yes Especially Philander, because Philander, when you were there, did they have a thousand students? It was close to, yeah, close to, but then the numbers right, right. had to come down. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Right. So, but you're right. And I'm just thinking about even the makeup of how you would even organize a protest at Philander based on all the variables that you talked about. Because I remember in all of our classes, we were definitely talking about, yeah. about the war. And, and 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 George Bush, because that was a major conversation too mm -hmm. about George Bush and his policies, because it wasn't even necessarily about 
just the war. It was just about how we how we felt he he thought about black people. Right, right, right. right. And, 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 and Condoleezza Rice and just that whole distinction between him and between her and Colin Powell, mm-hmm. right? So we cared about these issues, but yeah, the mobilization component of it, yeah, I didn't feel, I think like, it, like, it, like Philander and the type of student that was there, it just wasn't set up that way. So you bring important context that makes me think about my own HBCU yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's just the way that I look at it is, you know, I, I think, you know, people have tried to paint to say, oh, well, the HBCU students aren't concerned. I think people are using it as a teaching moment because I think still for a lot of those students, they don't have the broader context. And so it is good for them to be able to take a, a, something that's happening right now and learn about it. Because then I think it leads to some of your other thoughts in terms of how do we get students at HBCUs more engaged in foreign policy? This is a way for them to learn about things that they probably didn't talk about in high school. They can learn about it now, even if they aren't protesting. It still is for them to have some understanding of, well, where is the Ukraine? And how does this all fit together? And how is this change in NATO impact different things? Those are good things for them to learn about. So you don't have to protest, but you can still learn a lot. And I think that's where every HBCU can play and should play a role. I think if a faculty member is not talking about whatever it is, the contemporary politics of the day and weaving that into the curriculum, they're doing a disservice no matter where they are. Um, we're going to talk about my visit to Morehouse because you invited me there. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. But I want to ask you a question about, um, you know, you being a, a two time HBCU president. And how would you you know, you, you've seen your colleagues deal with some very challenging issues, particularly with Joe Biden being invited to um, to Morehouse. And then yeah. you have the you, you have the U.N. the, the U.S. Uh, United Nations Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. Uh, she had her invitation rescinded now. If you look at um, how Xavier responded, like the, the media reports, they said that it was a really a collaborative yep. decision with Xavier and the students. And so you had the Student Government Association. Yep. They were talking and yep. then they made it. They, they had a consensus, you know, saying, hey, you know, this is not going to be the best move. And they rescinded. Whereas with Morehouse, they invited them. Now, they invited uh, they kept the invitation for Joe Biden. But what you saw there was. It was just, it, it was a very um, it was a conversation about how a Morehouse man right would do in yeah. this situation, and so there weren't any of these massive protests or the Columbia style that we saw. But what you did see was some strong rebukes because I looked at those speeches and they were strong rebukes. And they did it yeah. like he was right behind them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So just but um, for you, how? You know, can you just tell me of any similar, you know, I don't know if you've been in any similar situations, but how do you feel like each of those presidents handled yeah. those situations and what and what's the blue and what and does it serve as a blueprint for HBCU presidents moving forward when these types of issues come up? Yeah, so they they are different. Um, so if you take for Xavier and even Xavier is different than most of the protests on the predominantly white campuses, because on those campuses, the people who are making demands and calling for this and that are sort of like these nameless and faceless and leaderless groups. It's not the SGA on the campuses. So you don't have somebody you have a relationship with who actually speaks for the the students. And that's why I always say like, so do you mean to tell me any random group of students can come together and say, on behalf of the students, we're demanding X, Y, and Z? It's like nobody elected y'all to do anything. So who are you? So I think, Xavier, you you have a different level of credibility when the SGA president is involved in saying on behalf of the students who duly elected that person, he had a level of credibility that these other places don't have. So I think that was number one. And I think he approached it the right way to say we're in conversations with the administration. And I think the administration said, let's talk to Linda Greenfield uh, people and say, hey, this is the issue here. I think the other thing that helped them is that she was supposed to give the commencement speech at the University of Vermont, and it got canceled like a month before. So I think her team was sensitive, too, because there was already one place where they had rescinded it. And I think this was more of a mutual decision with everybody. Her team said, yeah, we, we're not trying to cause any issues. Let's just go on. So I think everybody said it's a win for everybody because she didn't need to come and have people pissed off with her. And the president is even needed to have that. So I think everybody won. Everybody, and there's still some students who, because his president, his response said, we'll bring her here for another time. And I know a couple of students said she should never come. And I disagree with that completely. If that's when that's when she should come, when you have a chance to talk to her and engage her, because I think there are some people who think they know what's going on and they don't know. 
And so they, you need to talk to somebody like her. You need to learn about, I mean, she's a very important person. Even if you disagree, challenge her, but you can't. And I always tell people a commencement speech is not the time to do that. It's not a dialogue, it's a monologue. So when people say, well, students need to hear diverse views, it's like, yeah, but they can't challenge a commencement speaker. You don't have Q&A at commencement. You know, so that's not the right time. So for them to say, we'll bring her back at another time, I was like, absolutely. Which is, I kept telling people, that's what I wanted Morehouse to do. I wanted Morehouse to get with Biden's people and say, look, Biden should come and have a conversation with the students because based on all the information, the students at Morehouse were concerned about what's happening in Gaza, but they were concerned about inflation and job prospects and racism and police brutality. That's big in Atlanta with the cop city being built. So all of those things that could have been and it would have been a win for the president because the president could have said and his team could have said, you know what, it's more meaningful for us to engage in a conversation with these young men and then just let somebody else do commencement. So we'll do this instead. I think that could have been the win win. But I think his team would have felt like he's showing weakness for not doing that. It's still like, no, I'm still going to engage. I'm going to engage in a much more meaningful way than just come and speak at commencement. But I think his team around him didn't want him to do that. And I don't think the Morehouse people propose that. But that's what I would have proposed. Um, the other thing, too, that I think and I mean, I worked at Morehouse for a year when I was, you know, when you came because I helped launch their Black Men's Research Institute. Um, the dynamics of commencement there were different than other places where you saw a lot of protests because Morehouse does like a lot of places. You'll do alumni reunion classes and they were seated very prominently. You had as many alums as you had graduates, if not more. And that created a dynamic that I think would have been a little bit intimidating for the students because, you know, I read in the reports when they introduced the president, the students sat, didn't do anything, but the alums stood up clapping. And so you had this intergenerational dynamic going on there, too, that I think probably put some pressure. I, and I didn't expect anybody just to sort of show out in terms of protesting. But I just looked at that dynamic there where they see all these very successful Morehouse men who are going to be more conservative than the students and they riding with Biden. You know what I'm saying? And so that put a different level of pressure, I think, on the students. I'm glad the student in his speech at least raised some issues. Uh, I think that was good. But. I never expected there to be some kind of protest like you would see at some of these other campuses and people walking out. And the other reason I, I don't think you see people walking out, I don't know if you saw the Saturday Night Live skit that Keenan yeah. did. Yeah, That was every every person I showed that to, they were like, right, your grandmama's going to go crazy. If you, I spent all this money to watch you walk across that stage and you going to walk out because you mad at Biden, you, boy, you better not do that. I'm, I know that was a factor. So that was, so that's what, another thing for, because you got generations of people, you have I mean, you know, when you went to Philander, I mean, we would have people at graduation. One student could have 30 people, a whole busload of people come to see them graduate. <laughs> and so you telling me that I'm going to protest what's happening in Gaza and I'm going to walk out and I'm not going to walk across this stage and I got 30 people here? No, that's not happening. Black people not doing that. You just it, you you will disrespect your entire family if you did that. And so that's another difference because it means you still got, you know, you still have black students at HBCUs who are the first in their family to graduate. And their grandmama and them, they just happen to see that moment. They've been living for that. They don't care about what's happening nowhere else in the world. Baby, I pray for you to get across that stage. I need to see you walk across that stage. And I think that's that's a big part of it, too. I, I think that is the part of it. Because yeah. I had a group, of, I had a whole little contingent of people coming from Detroit. I mean, that's a whole particular type of thing, though, because yep. as somebody, and you know, um, my my career, my all of my graduate education is all foreign policy. I went, my, my first travel experiences were at Philander, but mm -hmm. it, it's like there's a duality that we that that we walk as Black people culturally, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, because we, for all the reason that you brought up, like we care about it, but then Big Mama here, and yep. I have to be honest with you, as somebody who's very vocal about Gaza, I'm honestly thinking about Big Mama. Like, yeah. I just am. And I'm it's just right. going to have to figure I'm because, Coach, like, that's what we're supposed, like, to do. And I would, I may even go as far as joining a protest elsewhere. Yeah. But, and as much intellectual venom that I have for Biden and for his policies and I light them up as much as I can on mm -hmm. Gaza on my editorial platforms Big Mama don't care about none of that shit she doesn't, not at she, all she, 
Not at but all. I don't think people. But I don't think people understand that. Yep. And it's a I, particular. Yeah. No, I know. I've seen it when people talk about it. You know, having been present places, and I've had parents come find me and just cry on me, just for that moment, just thanking you for being there for their child because they know the child was just wild, and some things I had to do to help that child stay in school. I mean, just the emotion of that. It's like it's my favorite day of the year is commencement because you just see these parents and the tears are real, and like I say, they hugging on you and crying and snotting on you like you're a member of the family. I can't imagine somebody saying, I'm going to deny my parents this opportunity because I'm protesting Biden not calling a ceasefire and, you know, not telling Netanyahu, who basically telling y'all, I don't care what y'all say. I'm doing what I'm going to do. So you're protesting and Netanyahu don't care about that. So you're going to deny your mom and them this moment because you think you no, no. I just like I said, I have seen it. I just seen it too much. I've seen the tears of the students. I just. That's not happening. But some of these other places, they go to NYU, they can spend sixty thousand dollars a year, and then when it's time for the president to get up, they just walk out. And I'm just like, so that's what that Saturday Night Live skit. Some people didn't re- uh, resonate with it, but every black parent resonated with it because they like absolutely. You better not. You better be in the books. You better be doing this because I'm spending too much money and I'm going into debt. You better get this degree. That's how our parents talk to us. Yep. I yep. mean, every black person should get that skit. I, I died laughing, right? Yep. You know, in fact, Anscape, which was which was the which used to be the undefeated under ESPN, right. they did a little um, a little snippet. They they mentioned it in a recent article about HBCUs in Gaza, and then there is a they mentioned the skit, and then like well, the funny part, um, it was uh, like the Black Columbia student dad. It was played by Kenan Thompson. Yeah, and he was like. Alexis Vanessa Roberts, you better have your butt in class. That's you right. Know, like that's what he said. Then this author said that she was talking to a friend who graduated from an HBCU, and he took a call from one of his mentees at Morehouse. And basically, before they hung up, he told the young man, "Don't get caught up in all that protest foolishness. Keep your ass in class." That's you right. Know? But that that but that's how our parents talk to us. That's right. That's and, right. Exactly. You know, and, and it's one because you know the thing is, black colleges are not unfamiliar with protests. I mean, right. hell. You know, right. that, and that's the whole thing, right? We're we're not unfamiliar with it at right. all. I mean, college campuses, you have black students that shut down the administration buildings. Yeah, like that's, that's right. Not uncommon, right? Right. But 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 we also have this cultural nuance. It wasn't commencement though. Right. It wasn't commencement. It was you not commencement. Me? It wasn't no. It's and even like you know with Howard, Howard students for Gaza, they went to go camp out at GW. But the yeah. longest protest in recent history was about the condition of the dorms. I can see that because that's like immediate, like right now, it's like we got mold, we don't have any heat. We protesting, we camping out. So they camped out for weeks at Howard, like in 2021. That was right then and there. So I see that happening. So yeah, like you just said, they're not immune to protest, but it's not commencement. You Everything you try to get through to that point because you got people coming and you got a lot of people coming and you, uh-uh. you, you better walk across that stage. I spent too much money. I'm in too much debt. I, I better see you walk across that stage. That's, that's. I mean, that's real. So that's that's a different. That's a cultural difference. And once again, it's a privileged thing. If you privilege, you don't care about how much money y'all spent and, and your people coming or your people might not even come like that. But they're not coming 20, 30 deep, you know, and driving, you know, 12, 14 hours to see you graduate. They. It's it's a different thing. You're you're right. So, but but you but see, you've also been at PWIs. And by the way, I always have to break down these acronyms for people who ain't in p- predominantly white institutions. Right. Um, but basically, you know, you've been on you've been at PWIs, and the way that a black student operates on a PWI is going to be vastly different at an HBCU right. because it's just all us. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so, like, we I remember when I was at the University of Illinois, we had a black graduation. Yeah. Which kind of mimic, which mimicked an HBCU, mm-hmm. but it really wasn't. You know what right. I'm saying? Like it was right. black folk, but yeah. it wasn't like our institution. It was right. black folks within a PWI where right. we could like really be ourselves. And we know obviously, like the, our the way that we walk across the stage is just vastly different. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But I want to ask you about, um, you know, you 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 mentioned how you would have handled the Morehouse situation by you know seeing if Biden would come at another time. I know what you mean when you talk about, or or let's just say um, you would object to students saying that um, Ambassador uh, Thomas Greenfield shouldn't come. And I know this from you because when I was employed at Philander, 
um, when you were president, you invited Ann Coulter right. to campus. Yeah. And boy, did they lighten to you, boy. Yeah. Like, you you know, I remember um, um, the guy, remember Joseph? Um, yeah, Joseph Jones. Joseph yeah. Jones. He wrote mm -hmm. a letter, a long letter to you. And you and your response, what I thought was perfect. And one of the main lines that, that I remember about it was that you said that if one woman can come over here and undo more than a hundred years of what the HBCU instilled to us, the HBCU needs to close. Right. Right. You know, because he thought, well, this is sacred ground and this woman is coming here with her, all of her mad crazy stuff. And she's, she does say bad shit, yeah. crazy things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but you were like, I trust my students to be able to hold up. And boy, did they ever. I remember yeah. <laughs> they, they did just fine. I remember. <laughs> oh my God. I, I wish that was recorded. Like it just needs to be shown. Like, um, once she said some crazy message, then one student very patiently got up. I remember the guy's name. And then she interjected and she was like, that's a typical Democratic brain point. He was like, I didn't say if I was a Democrat or a Republican. She went, she went off the rails. Mm -hmm. Right. And she, and I'm pretty sure you remember that, right? She, mm -hmm. she, she went off the rails and it goes to your point. The, even though she was a controversial figure and she talked, what you were demonstrating was that we are so intellectually engaged and, and our education holds up to anybody. Right. And so that was the point. So I definitely agree that, Hey, somebody like uh ambassador Thomas Greenfield, they should come. Yeah. And the students have a vigorous conversation with them because I don't think it helps our students, particularly when we're talking about these foreign affairs issues like Gaza that we stay siloed, that we need, like, it would be great for a, uh, a Linda Thomas Greenfield to come and have to engage students in a very vigorous manner. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and because, like I said, students, sometimes students think that they know about a subject, but you don't know what she knows because you haven't been sitting in rooms she's been sitting in and having a conversation. So you might say, well, I think blah, blah, blah. She just tell you, like, that's not true. That's not, let me tell you exactly. So it's a learning opportunity, but it's, it's sort of hard. And I guess particularly because, you know, since my wife worked with the Diller mock trial team and from that legal perspective, you have to understand all sides. You can't like if you're a lawyer, you only understand one side. You go into court, you're going to get beat every time because you got to know what other people are going to say. So you need to know those things that you don't agree with. But why don't you agree with it? I mean, we had the same thing here when I had Candace Owens comes and people were shocked. They were just like, I said, no. And let me tell you, students talked about her coming before and after they were engaged outside of class having these conversations. I was like, this is what higher education is. Let's have these conversations outside of class. What she said about this, what do you think about this? You know, and I told a lot of our students, you guys didn't even do enough homework because she said some things I wanted them to challenge that were factually incorrect. But she said it with such confidence that nobody challenged her on that. I was like, cause y'all didn't do enough homework. What she said was wrong, but y'all didn't know that. <laughs> and so those are the kinds of things they have to learn how to do. It's like, when you got somebody coming like that, you have to study up. So when she gets up there and says something, you go and fact check. So those are the kinds of, so I'm, I'm a proponent of that. Like I said, and I know the president will have her come and particularly Linda Thomas Greenfield. She's from Louisiana. She's from Louisiana. Yeah, right. she's connected as well. It's, and there could be some opportunities she could have for students who want to get into, you know, foreign service and politics. You want her to come to campus. You might disagree with her on some of these things, but she might be able to open some doors for you that will be very important. So Yes, she needs to come to campus and they all need to be up in there, even if they disagree, but they need to learn from her because she's been in some places that they have never been in. And exactly. there's still a learning opportunity where you, you you might not agree with anything she says, but they're, she's, she's similar background. They're going to agree on a lot. I bet they will. So, but, and, and that's the thing. And I, I second that because in my work, sometimes I go to the State Department and I do lectures. And so they invite me. Uh, and I've even spoken um, with members of the uh, National Security Council at the yeah. White House about you because they want me to give them, you know, my, my view from the ground here in Ukraine. Right. And there are a number of people who I may not agree with. But you're right. Um, so many things can't be said publicly. And it's really frustrating. And I, and I even had to train myself that because mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that people tell me that I can't say to people publicly. But I know because I have access as a journalist and a trusted yeah person with certain people within these communities and you know with with ambassador um um thomas greenfield there may be some things that she's balancing as hard as it looks from the outside yep. that she's doing on the inside that we don't even yep, know about we don't even know that, yep. that, that we don't even know 
because ultimately she's taking the word of the president and, and it's her choice to be the steward of those talking points. But what I've learned, the more I'm doing this work, the more complex that I've found it to be. Yeah. None of that negates the fact that you need to speak up. Right. You know, and because I think they do, because I definitely think that um, um, the policies of the White House towards Gaza are just completely wrong. But mm -hmm. the engagement part is just as important, even if you're staunchly in disagreement and opening up the doors to people like uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield are essential. But I want to talk to you about um, about this, uh, this far right attack on on um, college uh, president, college university presidents, <laughs> because the thing about these people is that they. Um, you know, this is something that happens at PWIs, namely when they start talking about Jewish student safety and all these other things, yeah. um, which I think they, you know, I think that they tend to, um, I don't think it's completely about that. They use that as an end, a scapegoat to uh, really jump down the throats of these presidents. But here's the bottom line. They don't know anything about running a school. No. And so, and so, so, so um, I really want to ask you, you know, with Harvard's uh, Claudia Gay, who was, forced to resign and then you have the president at university of pennsylvania what how do you feel about this reach from congress particularly the gop into how presidents run their schools yeah it's 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 horrible i mean so you know you have now and i'll watch it later the presence of rutgers and ucla and northwestern so they're going through they're they're going after what they call the so-called elite institutions um but i always tell people with that first hearing with MIT, Penn, and Harvard. And I kept telling people it just really wasn't fair. And it wasn't fair because the presidents of Harvard and Penn had just started their jobs July the 1st. And then you have October 7th, and then they're in front of Congress in December. They don't even know where the bathroom is good. You know what I'm saying? And so you got them in front of Congress. And so, and they were too dependent on the lawyers. And they gave all these lawyerly answers that pissed off everybody. So it was sort of like, you know, it depends on what the context is. That's a good answer, but they didn't. Get, they just felt constrained in terms of what they wanted to say or how they should have said it because they were just so new. And the president of MIT had been there a little over a year. So you had three very new presidents in front of a hostile Congress and you have Elise Stefanik talking to them like she's their mother. That's why I kept telling people, if, if I had been a president and they had called me in front of Congress, we would have gone viral for a whole nother reason. She would have got cussed out. And I would have said, just like, like you said, you've never run anything. You've been elected by some people, but you're one of 430 some odd people. So you're not making any high level decisions on your own. So I don't, you can't lecture me about what a college president does because you've never done the job. So first of all, you're not going to lecture me. You don't understand it. I'm here to, I provide the expert information to you. You can ask a question, but you're not going to talk to me because either you're going to get cussed out or I'm walking out of here. And, and, and the other thing I tell people too is that, I think they ran over them, even with the women who were in Congress. It was sexism, too. They talked to them. They talked crazy to them that they're not going to talk to men like that. It was I think that was part of it, too. So I looked at all those dynamics and then it got a little bit better. The president of NYU, even though she's still under some, you know, uh, scrutiny right now, she did a better job. But what helped her out is that the chair of their board is a long term journalist, uh, Claire Shipman. And she was able just to handle a lot of that because she just knows how to handle people working as a journalist for so many years. So that helped them out. It was a little bit better. I'd be curious to see how the men do. Um, but yeah, it's people are just scoring political points. And, you know, like Stefanik is the word. She, she, you know, cuts up and then they, you know, make the clip go viral to say, look, I'm holding people because she's auditioning to be the vice president. And that's all that's about. But no, she just they, they got the right people at the right time, because if had if it had been me, oh, y'all would still be watching the clip right now because she would have got dragged. She was got they would they would be trying to take me up out of there. I'm like, no, you're not talking to me like that because you haven't run anything. You don't have the and, and they, you have to think about it going into that. These people have an agenda. So you need to study these people. Who are the people I'm going to be talking to? What's their background? Because you need to come back and explain like you don't understand this and you don't understand that they're. So it, it was horrible, but they are the, the GOP is on a mission to dismantle higher education. And some of that is they don't want people who are providing facts and teaching people how to think critically because their whole base of people don't think critically. Whatever Trump says, they were not there and say, yeah, this is what it is. I see it on social media all the time. I got people who can't spell HBCU trying to tell me what Trump did for HBCUs. And I'm just like, no, what he said is a complete lie. But you don't know how to critically think. 
And so you throwing out numbers out there. You don't even know where the numbers come from because you didn't read the whole article that you just posted. I, I see you on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I see you on Twitter all the time. And it, it just amazes me how people um, just buy into his lies. And I'm saying, you know, as a journalist, because here's the thing, Dr. Kimball, one thing that people don't get you as an educator, as a career educator and me as a journalist, our responsibility are primarily to take in knowledge and read, right? Yeah. Like we are paid to take in information. We have different job capacities, but I'm literally here and my job is to travel around Ukraine so that I could tell folks in America, everyone else about what's going on. What's that's what that, that's yeah. what I do, right? right? Just when I came to Morehouse, like I was just talking to folks about my work and my experience and uh, the most people their jobs do not not give them the bandwidth right to where we are constantly having to think critically and crunch data yeah. every day like the both of us are yeah no you're no you're exactly right that's so i think that's why higher ed becomes a threat for some people who when your whole party is based on you know blind allegiance you just fall in line of whatever you're being told and you don't learn how to think critically for higher education like i said i want students to hear ann coulter or candace owens because you need to think critically about what they're saying to you and then fact check it and see is that true and really understand it that's those are important skills to have particularly in you know this internet age where you can get information so quickly and something can go viral and it can be just completely wrong you know because people aren't reading anything but i mean i watch people click headlines or articles or they'll post an article to me and they clearly have not read what's in the article. And then the funniest thing is that they post an article and I'm just like, yeah, if you read the article, you will realize that I'm, I'm quoted in the article. So obviously I know what I'm talking about and you have no idea. It blows people's mind when I do that. I'm just like, yeah, if you read in there, you can see what I said about what it is. So it shows you're wrong because you just posted an article with me in it. They don't even I, read. I, they don't I, even I read. saw it. I saw you do that one time. I saw you do that one time. Yeah. I did, the egg was like, bam. Like, yeah, right it's just like, you just, you're trying to tell me about something that I'm quoting in as an expert. And I'm telling you, you don't know what you're talking about because it's like people looking at the picture, like, oh, the headline. And the headline doesn't even tell you all the other stuff that's going on in the article. And then if I start citing things, it's like you're reading what this journalist wrote in this article. I'm going to look at the data tables from the Department of Education. And I'm showing you, here's the data table in the Department of Education where I can show you that Trump zeroed out this money that you want to give him credit for giving somebody. A quick story. So talking about data tables, before we get into the final segment of here, like there was a guy that I met um, on, the on the campaign tour, on the campaign trail in 2018 that was covering Stacey Abrams' president, uh, gu gubernatorial run. And he was, she was in some little small town uh, campaigning and some guy with a MAGA hat, like some Colombian dude came in with a MAGA hat on mm -hmm. and he was like, I just came here to see if she would support Stacey. You know, if, if Stacey Abrams would support Donald Trump, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what world that you exist in, but that, yeah. that would never happen. Right. And so she, and so basically he, um, he, he, I said, well, what, what do you care about? He very randomly said, well, I'm just so angry that all these trans people are coming into the military and, and, and generating billions of dollars and costs for you know their 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 surgeries and things. I'm like, okay, first, let's just establish the fact that you're a transphobe. Let's just kind of mm -hmm. start there, right? And then you said, no, I'm not. Yes, sir. Yeah, but okay. But let's get with this number one billion. How many trans people do you think exist in the United States of America? Okay, it's like a percent, right? Yeah, like a percent, one point five percent. And then how many of those people actually um, are in, in the armed forces? Okay infinitesimal numbers so just right. logically right this billion, you really think let's just say a thousand people if we're going to put that number out there a thousand do you think that they're going to generate billions, billions of dollars just right. logically does that make sense but what he didn't know was that before i took this job at the root i was i was a military reporter and so mm. i was country military um data points in these sets that you're talking about and the thing is is that the two of us is nothing for us to find it but sometimes these data tables they're not going, you, you have to know how to look for things, but they're there. You get what I'm saying? You have, and to, the, and here's a, you have to know, but but most people don't know how to look because they, they're not they, doing it every day. Go, which goes don't. back to your point, which goes back to your point of I'm looking at these data tables because they don't even know how to readily assess them like the two of us were in our respective fields. And so I'm like, okay, tell me where you got your information from. So I gave the guy his, my phone. I said, show me where you yep. got this from. And so what I wanted him to do 
was I wanted him to take me down like a digital like track of, you know, from what article to what article. And then it was like he started at Breitbart. I'm like, okay, we're starting off at a bad place. Right. And right. then he went to Fox News and it was just like a disinformation like yeah. trail. Yeah. And I said, okay, you start off with something true. And once you look at the real number, they got this number here and the link to where the data tables were weren't even in the article. They took some article that was legitimately true, but then the original journalists who did the work, they know where to find it. Right. But like seven articles back, you're not going to even click through all those just to just to assess whether or not what you're getting is really real information. So definitely. Yeah. No, that's no, it's there's like a quote somebody says is there's a difference between doing a search and doing research. And what most people say, they do a search, they go to Google and they'll put in, like I said, Trump and HBCU. And the first article that comes up, they're like, here, this proves my point. It's just like, yeah, it's like I'm telling you, I'm looking at data tables. I'm reading dissertations. I'm doing that's research. You ain't done. No, people just say, well, do your research for them. It's like, let me do a quick Google search. Oh, this is the first thing that come, you know came up or the second thing. And I put those out there and I was like, yeah, now go back and look at those articles and then find the original sources. That's just one article. But dig deeper and people don't do the research. And, and the other thing that you said, which is true, people aren't asking the right question because that's the other part. You have to know what to look for. So you, if you're not asking the right question, you're going to get the wrong answer every time. Absolutely. So I, I want to go back to my my trip to Morehouse. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you inviting me there. And one of the, I always want to talk to black students about foreign policy because I feel like there are so many of us that would actually make that that would be great for yeah. U.S. diplomacy, yeah. um, you know, and I feel like our just experiences of being black in this country, the fact that we have our own particular experiences is so vital because, you know, we, we need people in these roles that can look at America critically. Yeah. Right. Because, see, our, our the, you know, the people who are considered our adversaries, they do. Yeah. And and what I found is just just my experience of just alone, because I think being black in this country matters because the thing about foreign policy, the way I look at it very simply is about how do you want the world in which you live to exist? You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, so how, 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 what, what, how do you think the world should function? We can get into treaties and all this other stuff, but ultimately, you know, it's people, I look at it as an extension of urban planning, right? Like how a city is planned out, the schools go here, the park goes there yeah. and, and, and the shopping, you know, district is right here the way that these countries are carved up around the world is done in a similar way. It's a whole bunch of white men who ordinarily would be designing cities. They're just, they're, they're carving out the world. Mm -hmm. And I want black people, you know, people like Morehouse, the people with character to be getting into these roles and doing it and going to Morehouse and just having the conversation with those students that you helped to convene it was a really enjoyable thing. And then plus we, you know, after I did the talk at the lecture, I was talking about my work in Ukraine and then, you know, we had a little lunch and then we continued yeah. the conversation and it was really engaging and they were genuinely interested right. in Ukraine because I don't deal with the kind of, I, I focus mostly on, I'm doing Eastern European politics yeah. and they're engaged. And so I tell people here in Ukraine and elsewhere, yeah, black people are interested. We just have to engage them on the subject and they themselves are curious. And so it's important that people like you uh, extend the invitation so that we can keep these conversations going so that we can be informed. Right. No, exactly. I mean, that's always been my thing. I want to expose students to a variety of people, you know, and different ideas and career paths they haven't even thought of. I just think it's so important. There's so many doors that could be open for students to say, oh, I didn't know that was an opportunity. I could, you know, I could do that. That's interesting to me. We can't just, you know, expose people to the same ideas and the same kind of folks all the time. It's a range of things I think is very important. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I just I believe in that. And I want to hear from different people, too. I still want to learn. So what can I learn about different things? If I, you know, you lead an institution and you become you're not curious anymore. I don't think you do any good as a leader. If you're not curious, it's like, yeah, that's something or that's an idea that makes me uncomfortable. Let's bring that person in. I need to be challenged. So, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the thing is, is that. Um you know, one thing about uh, HBCUs, like I, I actually joined Peace Corps. I was accepting the Peace Corps um, after enrolling, uh, after us uh, applying when I was at Philander Smith. Hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. so I was supposed to go to Russia, but Russia canceled their program. Then I ended up going to the country of Georgia. 
Okay. And, you know, and so, you know, one of the things that I've actually tried to do with a lot of HBCUs, because I send out like these uh, letters to people saying, hey, you know, I'm here in the United States at this time and I would like to come to your school, da, 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 da. Um, Howard, you know, I, I've gone to Howard, Dan, and Dan Morehouse, but I found it a bit more challenging to really um, get into the HBCU circuit because, you know, one of the things that I don't like to be accused of is not engaging my people. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. You know, and so I'm very active and I try to reach out to the historically black schools. It's just been a harder sell. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a challenge. And, and I think for a lot of the institutions, they get caught and caught up in doing the same kinds of things they've done over and over again. Um, so, I mean, I still think that we suffer as a sector from sometimes a lack of creativity. You have folks with some kind of old school mentality about how we do a lot of things. I just think we still got we still got work to do on that. And I mean, some places just struggling just to get through the day to day and they don't yeah, have the, the bandwidth to try to even be creative. But there are opportunities to do that. We just have to be intentional to do that. Uh, like I said, which is why I like to, you know, whenever I've been a president to have different people to come in, I like to share that so I can, you know, get other people to start thinking differently about what they do and say, y'all could do this too. You know, that I think it helps for somebody to model that behavior. Um, for I, other I, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Cause, Cause another thing too, I feel like um, places like um, Howard, for example, uh, I was considering going to Howard for graduate school mm -hmm. and because, you know, they have the Ralph Bunch international yeah. center yeah. there and for a lot of people who don't know, Ralph Bunch was a deputy um, um, secretary general for the United Nations. He was, you know, as an African-American man. Right? right. So there have been people like Kofi Annan who are from the continent right. who served in these top roles. But Ralph Bunch was like one of the last African-Americans mm -hmm. to get up that high, you know, and he was such a consequential figure in foreign policy. But they how the reason why I didn't go to Howard was because. They had a uh, like they, they. I wanted to focus on Eastern European politics in particular, and they had a Russia program, but it was downgraded to a minor. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are a lot, a lot of reasons enrollment, etc. But I, but I do what, what I would like to see more is federal investment. You know, in HBCUs mm -hmm. for international education, yeah, because. Yeah. You know, because I graduated from the University of Illinois, they had a center there. And I'm pretty right. sure, like, places like Morehouse and, Spel you know, um, I mean, there are a number of schools. North Carolina and a and have international centers, but it's an issue of the funding, right? Right, right. Um, that, that, as you know, like, it's a funding thing. Like, they can have yeah. centers. But I just think that it should be a priority to train HBCU students. Um, you know, like if, if the language is French or Spanish, whatever, you know, it doesn't even have to be Chinese, whatever. Right. right. Um, do assessments at schools so that our institutions can be graduating people so that they can take these posts. Right. Mm -hmm. And eventually get into roles where they could be a Linda Thomas Greenfield. Yeah. Um, you know, the, or, or the version that they think that should exist in these roles. Right. If you think that um there could be a better variant of that than and you know i think that we could that these our schools should be invested in and in creating these new types of uh approaches and new thinking to how we look at the world and so i just i think my frustration comes from the fact that you know i think that i'm like the only black only black journalist that's here yeah and you had a whole bunch of situations where Africans who are studying here that were fleeing the war, fleeing mm -hmm. to Africa. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, right. That was like I mean, going going mm -hmm. to Europe like that was a frustrating thing because I was with soldiers and I couldn't cover it. But I would have loved to see some black folks there because if if black folks aren't covering this stuff, it's not going to be covered, man. Right. 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 And I just wish that there are just more students that were trained in this part of the world and that's where to cover these things because it's a bunch of white men. And even the ones that are well-meaning, it, it's nothing like having a cultural context that 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 gives that 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 accompanies the reporting is so essential. So institutions like where you work, um, they they should you should have students that specialize in this stuff so that they can contribute to the media coverage and yeah. foreign politics. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Dr. Kimbrough, man, I, I really appreciate you taking time um, 
to talk to me about this. But I want to, one more question for you, man. Like, I really want to ask you, um, like, if you can have a, you know, what, like a, a, your idea of helping more HBCUs to, to, um, to be more engaged from a, from an administrative standpoint in, in foreign policy, mm -hmm. uh, education, um, like what would that look like? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a good, um, a good question. It probably would start through some of the advocacy groups like UNCF or Thurgood Marshall to help do some convenings and to use to leverage some of their relationships with the federal government to do that. Um, even though the White House initiative on HBCUs, I mean, you're giving me some ideas right now. I, I sit on the president's advisory board. Um, that might be something that we, we look at too. But I, I think just normally the challenge with our sector is that people have so many of these pressing needs like infrastructure issues. And right now with the FAFSA being delayed, people worried about making their classes and getting students. So those are always for HBCUs. The challenges is that you seem like you're always putting out fires for stuff that, you know, just based on the, the population that you serve that has a lot of needs, it makes it harder for you to really have the time to say, let's be very thoughtful about some big picture thing that can help, you know, and that's why certain institutions like a, a Howard can do that because, you know, a quarter of their budget comes from the federal government every year. You get $235 million from the federal government. They can create all kinds of centers for stuff. And you're in D.C. You know, they're sort of set up to do that, even though they still have some of the same challenges as everybody else. But the average school that doesn't have that kind of federal support, you know, they're just trying to, you know, sometimes they're just trying to get by. And that becomes part of the challenge. So I think, you know, um, there are some opportunities to do that. Hopefully we can get to a space where there will be some other institutions that strengthen themselves enough. They can start dabbling and address some of these issues. Because I think you're right there. I think there's some great opportunities. We got to get some other schools involved in that and not just the same four or five that, you know, basically are able are in a position to take advantage of everything. So Absolutely. Dr. Kimbrough, man, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, no problem.